And the reason I do that is because it's not just organic, but it has all the microbes and it's like a, it's like a probiotic for your soil. It makes your soil very healthy and right, it makes the microbes yeah. grow. And when you have a good microbe, microbial uh, community in your soil, it will give your plants all the nutrients it should have. I wish I didn't have fertilizer all over it. Oh, those are fertilizers? So here, oh, talking here. of fertilizer, what do you use again as your fertilizer? My, my, my go-to is Grow More Magnum Rose Food, and it's an 8108, and I use that liquid. It's uh, supposed to be for roses? Is that it what is, it is? It is, yeah. Okay. Just about anything for roses or tomatoes is really good for Echinopsis and Trichoceras. But anything do, do for not, roses or tomatoes. Yeah, but do I not see. use it full strength. I always cut it way back and uh, just one word of caution when using uh, liquid fertilizer is if you use too much you will kill your plants so start out slow keep good records mm -hmm. and uh, don't if you see really good results don't get overzealous and then feed them again because you think they want more how often do you feed them about every six to seven weeks in the summertime that's when it's hot when it cools off around November, December, I stop feeding and I just let them go dormant and they get a lot less water. So I always refer to these as um, they're succulents and they're kind of like reptiles. Reptiles go dormant in the winter time and don't do a whole lot. And when it's cold, their metabolism slows down. Mm -hmm. But when it's really, really hot, their metabolism is in high gear and they can use a lot more nutrition to bloom and to grow and to do cellular respiration. Right. But so, then there's always a limit. You don't want to overdo anything. If you see really good results, that means you did it right. So let it go for at least six weeks before you do it again. How do you know if you're over fertilizing it? You'll see your plants uh, collapse and rot. <laughs> oh, they rot? Yes. And or they will grow and expand too fast yeah. and split down the side you'll see splits i see us yeah yeah and that happens sometimes here. when you're pushing them too hard there's a just to show how a split. a split looks like so you see a that's split a like split that, <laughs> you're probably growing it too fast and it's absorbing too much water too quickly so you might want to back off on feeding and back off on watering okay and a lot of times people think the hotter it gets the more often i should water that's a big mistake as well and i think you probably have found when it's really really hot and the plants are saturated you get more uh, fungal and bacterial infiltration and your plants can die from that. So it's a hard thing to watch your plants dry out and go through hot spells. But when it's 115 out, you probably don't want to go water until you, you get a little dip in the weather. That's the temperature when I get home in a couple of days yeah. <laughs> in Vegas. But it will be 112, well, I think. You don't want to be watering every other day or every day. Some people think that's what they want and that's overdoing it. So when it's so hot, you uh, you recommend also doing a little bit of watering or less watering? Not necessarily less, but you want to make sure your plants dry out a little bit before you rehydrate them. Okay. So you use you use uh, rose or uh, tomato more, for flowering? Yeah, okay. that's an 8108. And I recommend that because it has a real good chelated miners package and it has extra calcium and... I believe it has extra sulfur. What is the name again? I'm sorry. Grow more. Grow more. Magnum rose food. Magnum rose. Is that liquid? You can buy that or online. Uh, it's a liquid. Liquid. Correct. So okay. if you apply it on your plants, you need to wash it off within an hour or it will burn your plant. And you then mean after applying, you have to applying, water it you need again? To water it in. Absolutely. Oh, that's you what I do not plants. do. <laughs> you should water your plants once, uh -huh. apply your fertilizer, liquid fertilizer, onto your plants, and then come back and wash them off. Oh, 
If you don't, you will get major burn and scarring on your plants because the fertilizer is kind of acidy. You wash not you just the wash. top, but even the roots? No, you... you just go through and water, do a light water, a quarter water. Quarter water? Mm -hmm. oh. Just to get it into the pot, into the roots, down into the soil. That way it's not on the surface in high concentration and it's not on the plant. You don't want it to stay on the plant. That's a bad idea. Wow. And then a couple of times a year, I do augment my fertilizing regimen with uh, chicken manure. Chicken it's a granulated, manure. dehydrated chicken pellet, and it's a ratio of four to two. So and that one is for growing? Yeah, it's great for everything. Grow. Roses, okay. succulents, tomatoes, cactus, everything. And the reason I do that is because it's not just organic, but it has all the microbes. And it's like a... It's like a probiotic for your soil. It makes your soil very healthy and it right, makes the microbes yeah. grow. And when you have a good microbe, microbial uh, community in your soil, it will give your plants all the nutrients it should have. So I'm not a... I am learning a I'm lot a, from you, Brent. I'm not a PhD in botany. <laughs> but, but over the well, years, you learn little yeah. tricks. And you don't want to use one fertilizer continuously all the time you you always want to do at least two or three different fertilizers at different times of the year because one might be deficient in some nutrient mm -hmm. and sometimes when i've used one fertilizer for over a year or two i'll see mutated colors in my flowers so the flowers stop being true to their form and that's they will what actually... i noticed like mm -hmm. last year i remember this being more yellow now it's more orange red so i don't Correct. understand and they are very um variable in color the colors can change i had one plant bloom one week and it was one color and i uh, I photographed it and then the same plant bloomed again the following week and mm -hmm. it was a completely different color. And the only reason was different amount of light and a different amount of fertilizer. So oh. fertilizer does affect the color of the flower. That is so interesting. So where do you source like your mother plants if you want something? Oh, I still shop eBay every day. I look on eBay you every still do? single day. <laughs> You'd be yeah. surprised what's on eBay. You have to be on eBay every single day or you will not get anything. And you have to look at newly listed. Uh -huh. That's one of my secrets. I won't give away too many of my secrets. You know, importing from other countries, a lot of people ask me about that. And I, I am kind of steering away from that because number one it's not legal to import them without the proper permits right very difficult yes and customs will take everything you try to import and they confiscate it and keep it so you can try but uh, it's not recommended and so there are collectors here and a variety of other collectors and now we're starting to trade among collectors for things that we don't have and then the primary source for having new material is I'm growing them from seed. So I'm creating my own hybrids and growing them from seed. And for the last three years, I've been having the results of that. It took about four to five years for the first batch to start flowering. And now we're in year seven. Wow. And I still have a lot of that are patience. Seven years old that haven't flowered yet. And the good news is it was worth it. For a long time, I didn't think it would be worth it. but. We've gotten seedlings that were so impressive that it really was uh, something that we didn't expect. So a lot of variety, a lot of color form, large flowers, and a lot of different things, including mutations and variegated plants. And it's, it's really, you know, I would like to do more cactus and I just need more time. I'm a school teacher by trade, so my, oh, my full-time job. Teach? I teach special education for kindergarten through fifth grade. That is so and unbelievable because I am a teacher. Oh, I'm a substitute teacher. Okay. But you being a special educa special education mm -hmm. teacher, I admire your your I, I call this my therapy. Your task. <laughs> <laughs> they don't talk back. They're a little prickly, but that's okay. Oh, you're used to the prickly types. Anyway, so what this one is, is what is this? This is a a Dimmit hybrid. 
and it was done quite a long time sunset. ago, but it's still not readily available today. And the reason why most of these plants are not readily available is because you have to have mother stock. You have to have plants to cut from, propagate from, yes, to make plants for sale. It has to be a piece off of an original plant. It can't be a seedling off of a named plant because seedlings come out differently than than the parents, obviously. Mm -hmm. But not a lot of people know that. So I like to send an established plant. And the good news is most of the small plants, even if they're small, they'll bloom because mm -hmm. they're off of an original plant that's already bloomed. Like I said, it takes sometimes five, six, seven years for a plant to flower from seed. But once it flowers, even the little offsets on the side will flower. So if you take it as an offset, it It'll will bloom flower every year. Yeah, you won't have to faster, wait years right? for it to bloom. And if it's not blooming, most likely it's not getting enough light or most likely it's not getting enough nutrients. Uh, can you show us some of your hybrids if you have any uh, flower right, right now? Right now, most of the trichoceras are not blooming. But if you go and you follow me on Instagram at Torch Cactus, you can see a lot of my new hybrids. I do. I, I keep looking at there. the pictures and I'm always like so amazed. One of my favorite amazed. ones is Serape times Flying Saucer. I call it Flying Serape. Flying Serape. Yeah. Versus, uh, I haven't found a better name. But that flower is about nine inches tall and it's just amazing. And then there's good yellows wow. and pinks and light pinks and That is so beautiful. The yellow one the yellow, is these variegated. Are variegated. If you haven't seen, those are variegated. So the plants... Um, what are they? Now, variegation is a mutation. It's a mitochondrial mutation where the plant cannot make sugars. So the cells are damaged. And the mitochondria is uh, an organelle in the cell that does uh, um, things chemically to give the plant uh, food. So the yellow areas are mutated or deficient mitochondrial uh, areas and then the green parts are, are typically normal. So there's just enough good stuff to feed the plant and keep it alive. But there's a lot of people who are variegated collectors. They'll collect anything variegated. You're right. It it also makes it more but it has to be valuable and more you Some know, things are variegated pricey. and ugly <laughs> and some things are really variegated. Like these are really variegated and uh, they're a little fussier. You have to keep them in the shade. They shouldn't have any full direct sunlight. So if it's variegated, you prefer yeah. or you recommend a little bit more shade? It's like being a very pale skinned individual and being out in the sun a lot. It's probably not a good oh, idea. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> what do you call this um, cactus here? That is Echinopsis jealousy. And it's jealousy. Mm -hmm. Wow, beautiful. The interesting thing is the variegation has not changed the flower color. I thought it would, but it didn't. You would think, but you would think. apparently it didn't. Like if it comes from a variegated aerial, yeah, it's a different color. This just came out of one of my plants one day. There this was is a, a jealousy one as well. Yeah, there's jealousy and I think that was jealousy over there as well. So sometimes if you're paying attention, you'll Ooh, see one little plant, <laughs> a little bulb will come out and it'll have a little bit of variegation. So take it off when it's big enough and select that and grow it. Yeah, that's Hunstruck Rubin. That's a really pretty one. Hunstruck. Which, which Hunstruck, one is this? Hunstruck, I guess you could call him. My camera is not doing justice on the colors, no, guys, but yeah. this is so beautiful. The funny thing is with a lot of these flowers, if you take them inside and you tear the petals apart and you put them on a white plate, then you can get an honest look at what the color is. But outside, your your eyes cannot really perceive what it's looking at, and there's an optical illusion. Wow. So it blends the colors together. Your your eyes are guessing with your brain as to what color it is. Yeah, sometimes like I see this, it's like bright magenta. Right. So but when I take a picture, if you it took turns this out, off, oh, and then you put it on a white plate, uh -huh. then you will get a really good evaluation as to what exactly the color is. And you would be surprised to find that this is peachy. A peachy color but out here it looks magenta to me with the reflection of the sunlight <laughs> it is magenta oh so that's the way to do it that's a trick guys that's when a you're trick. looking at seedlings and you have three seedlings that look similar 
you'd be surprised if you take the flowers apart and put them on a white plate, a white paper plate, and take them inside and out of the UV light, you will see their true colors. So these are wow. So there's something coming down here. If I could guess, that's probably Heinz. Are these all Reuben. stock plants? These are all stock plants. And this is where I gather a lot of my seed. A lot of times I'll have to take plants in the house and cover them so bugs can't steal my pollen or cross pollinate. It's very difficult. When you cross pollinate, is there a certain time of the day that is best to do it or how long is the, well, has the flower been opened? The best way to do it is to somehow cover up the flower. So even if the flower opens, bugs can't get to your pollen. And then, then you can take your time. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the, the, the flower can be receptive for a very short amount of time, maybe even a few hours. Is it early in the morning or Typically when it's, it's about early to close? In the morning. Yeah. Early in and the a morning. lot of these bloom in the middle of the night. They'll start opening up at about nine o'clock mm -hmm. and they'll be fully open all night long. And it always makes me wonder if some of these are night pollinated. There are a lot of trichoceras that are night blooming, like trichoceras, pachinoi varieties. Those are night blooming. Yeah, and uh, they Equinoxes do open, they open as well. in the There's afternoon, but they're dead by the next morning. <laughs> yeah, so they're all variable. Do you freeze your pollens? Have you done that? Uh, I used to. Um, it's just so labor intensive. Uh huh. So and you just do if it, it if it's something where it only blooms at one time of the year, and I'm trying to cross it with something that blooms at a distinctly different time of the year. You have to freeze your pollen. And when you want to do that, you got to take the anthers off and put them in a tube. Keep the tube open for three or four days and let the, the anthers or the pollen fully dry. They need to be very dry and dihiss. Do you just keep the powder pollen or the just whole... Just the little part, the, the, just, the, the, the anther, actually the yellow the anther itself. Oh, I see. If we look over here, I'll show you on this flower. So these are the anthers right here. Oh my gosh, you're dissecting your flower. And so <laughs> so you that's can take those what you... and just take the little yellow parts and then put that in a tube and let it dihiss. But as you can see, these have already been robbed by the bees. There's no pollen left. Oh. So you got to be an early bird and beat the bees. The bees come up when the sun comes up. Before the sun comes up and it's still light outside in the early hours of the morning, the bees are not out and you can get the pollen. How long can you store the pollen in the You can the store it indefinitely fridge. if it was deep frozen. I find in a regular freezer with, you got to put packets of dryer right to keep it nice and dry and have it in a special capsule that is surrounded by frozen material. It'll last two or three years easily, if not five years. That's a long time, five years. <laughs> but I mean, if you want to have a wow, a, a, a liquid nitrogen, you know, cryogenically frozen. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, it'll, it'll last indefinitely it'll... as long as you have electricity. Mm hmm But no one needs to really go that far with right. <laughs> Get a fruit. I used fruit. to do a lot of hybridizing with aloes, and there's aloes that bloom in the summer, and there's aloes that bloom in the winter. Mm hmm And if you cross the two together, the only way to do it is freezing the pollen. You get aloes that bloom all year around which is a big secret that a lot of people don't know. Because I... the plants are confused. So it's half winter growing aloe, half summer blooming aloe. And when you put them together, they'll bloom every month. Wow. Very interesting. But you gave up on your aloes? No, I didn't give up. I just very selective now. And they have to be what I call bulletproof aloes. Bulletproof means they don't get aloe mite. They don't get thrip in the crown mm -hmm. and they can survive in all different types of climates nice. because I'm tired of spraying my plants for bugs. <laughs> I see you're growing some opuntias yeah, as well. A, a friend of mine has got a huge collection of opuntias and if you ever want to buy all kinds of amazing opuntias. It's Tom Jesh and his nursery is called Waterwise Botanical Gardens. I was there uh, yeah. two years ago before the pandemic. Yeah. Yes. And he is an avid opuntia collector and he's probably got 200 varieties of opuntias. Not all of them for sale at the same time, but uh -huh. very unusual ones. Here's one in particular I like. And, you know, I always hear people say, oh, I love cactus so much, but they have spines. 
glow kids. So here's one <laughs> that has no spines. Here's another. Oh, you're here. touching it. Oh my goodness. No spines. No glow kids. <laughs> no spines. Now, what, what are they? This is um. <laughs> you're what? giving me a heart attack by rubbing. No, don't do it, babe. Bacillaris <laughs> bracticata. Bracillaris brac. brac Bracticata. Now, if you want to hear something interesting, ask people, why do cactus have spines? So, I'll ask you. Why do cactus have spines? Uh, it, what do you it, think? It, 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 I think it, it, it's because they can have a, a, a little bit of shade, shade because they can survive in the hot. You are... He's a genius. <laughs> <laughs> Most people say cactus have spines That's because the son of a... He, he, I think and, he nailed and, it. And also to protect themselves. Okay, good. I'm glad you said that. Most I'm people will say you, son. <laughs> they only have spines to protect themselves. Oh, I'm sorry. So now, that's okay. But now we're pretty sure. I have a friend, he works at UC Davis. He's a professor over there and he's doing experiments on cactus. And what he has found in laboratory experiments is he puts thermometers in his cactus embeds thermometers in them and then he snips Whoa. he snips off all the spines off of his cactus and what he's found is the cactus will heat up by six to eight degrees <laughs> now what we found out with a lot of cactus and this might not be true of every cactus but most cactus that have large heavy spines have that as an actual air conditioning system the air goes through the spines and actually cools the plant down it's kind of like having your feet in a pool on a hot day. It makes you feel good. It's psychological. Maybe it's psychological for us, but for cactus, it actually cools the plant down. And wow. it also serves as protection from pests that might want to eat them. Yeah, that's that's the common, you that's know, common what thing. people so know. It's for protection, protection. This, this form, this Bacillaris, grows in a very mountainous area where it doesn't need spines to regulate its oh, yeah. temperature and it's in a very humid temperate climate versus a very deserty climate so it has evolved without spines just like a lot mm. of south american cactus that grow in i feel like i want to touch it but i'm scared go ahead and touch it <laughs> i guarantee you're not going to get hurt but it looks like it has spines and it looks totally dangerous oh yeah it doesn't even have the fuzzy stuff that Feels like fiberglass. It has a little bit on the tips, but once it grows right, yeah. out, it's smooth. Yeah, you're right. So wow. So anytime you can find a spineless cactus, uh -huh. you found a gold mine because everybody's going to want it. Yeah. Are you now selling thing, some of that? No, I haven't. Yeah. But this careful. plant doesn't not really the tip, have a not whole the tip. lot of flowers. It doesn't have a pretty flower. So that's the only drawback. It's still flowers though, right? Yeah. yeah. But this plant to my right here, or your right, if you touch that, you would be in pain for the oh, next two days. Oh, that's the counterpart. <laughs> right, because there's not long spines, but I actually think what's worse than the long spines are these short, fuzzy, hair-like structures at the base of, of the spine. And that can actually float through the air and land on you, and, and it feels like fiberglass. What? So anytime you see a really fuzzy-looking cactus, beware. Don't touch it. You'll be in for it. And they're really hard to get out. 